door where we now host in-person and virtual events along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything in FIRM, please go to, to, to our website, politics-pros.com. Um, before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your phones. When we get time for the Q&A, we've placed a mic right there um, at, um, next to that pillar. Um, at the end, please line up at the mic and speak into it clearly so that everyone can hear your question. Um, we're filming this event for our Politics and Pros YouTube channel, and it's also, um, there's a live recording on our website. Once the event concludes, we will have time for a signing. Please line up here at the same pillar and have your books ready to be personalized. Um, if you have not already purchased them, books are available at the registers. Once the event is complete, we ask that you please fold up your chairs and lean, lean them against something solid. Um, so now, without further ado, we're here, here to celebrate V, formerly Eve Ensler, for her newest book, Reckoning. Unflinching, intimate, introspective, courageous, Reckoning ex explores ways to create an unstoppable force for change, to love and survive love, to hold people and states accountable, to reckon with de demons and honor the dead, to reclaim the body, and to see oneself as connected to a greater purpose. V is a Tony Award-winning playwright, author, performer, and activist. Her international phenomenon, the Vagina Monologues, have been published in 48 languages and performed in more than 140 countries. She's the author of The Apology, the New York Times bestseller, I Am an Emotional Creature, the highly praised In the Body of the World, and many more. She's also the founder of V-Day, which is the largest global movement to end violence against women and girls, and also the founder of One Billion Rising, the largest global mass action to end gender-based violence in over 200 countries. Um, and it's the 25th anniversary of V-Day. Uh, v is the co-founder of the City of Joy, a revolutionary center for women survivors of violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, along with Christine Schuler, um, de Shriver, and 2018 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Dr. Dennis McWaji. She's one of the Newsweek's 150 Women Who Changed the World and Guardian's 100 Most Influential Women. She currently lives in New York. V will be in conversation with Rachel Louise Snyder. Snyder is the author of Fugitive Denim, the novel What We've Lost Is Nothing and No Visible Bruises, winner of the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award, the Hillman Prize, and the Helen Bernstein Book Award, and the finalist for the NBCC, LA Times Book, Book Prize, and Kirkus Award. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Slate, and elsewhere. Um, a 2020 and 2021 Guggenheim Fellow, Snyder is a professor of creative writing and journalism at American University. She lives here in DC. And we have an event for her up, um, forthcoming memoir, Woman We Buried, Woman We Burned. The release party for that is on May 20th. So now please join me in welcoming V and Rachel Louise Snyder to Politics and Prose. Hello? No. You're not on yet. Hello. What? Is this working? Is it? Oh, he can hear us. Yeah, yeah. there we go. <laughs> I just want to say um, the second row is reserved for my friends, and they are, they're some of them, they're, they're terrible at being on time. <laughs> <laughs> I can see some of them back there, though. Yeah. They, you think I don't see you? I see you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to be here with you and with all of you. Thank you for coming out on this um, night of winter, winter night. Yes. Winter, State of the Union. Yeah. Yeah. These people have their priorities, though. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to, I'm going to be self indulgent. I hope that you'll all forgive me for this, but as a writer, I don't get to like talk shop with writers all that often. So I just have one writerly question that I'm going to ask and then I'm going to get that out of the way and ask more normal things. But this book, in case you, I'm assuming most of you haven't read it because it's been out for about seven minutes. Oh, jeez. I'll get it for you. Stay there. Just stay there. You're going to get it for yeah. me? Thank you. It's easier this Why, way. Why, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so this book has been out for what, two days, three days? Three days. Yeah, so you probably haven't had a ch chance to read it yet. But this is genre it's a genre defying book it is not just nonfiction. it's poetry it's um 
uh, it's photographs, it's keynotes, it's op-eds, it's letters, it's all kinds of, it's monologues. You write, you know, in third person and in first and in second, I think. <laughs> um, present tense, past tense, it's really uh, like just a beautiful, a beautiful book that defies definition. And so I just wonder if you could start us off by talking about just the artistic landscape as a choice. You mean how I put this together? Yeah. 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 Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here with this woman because I admire her work so much. And we've done a lot of work together thinking about domestic violence and any violence against women, trans, and non binary people. So it's great to be here with you. And thank you so much for doing with me. Um, you know, this book is, is it's a very strange book. It kind of grew out of, of COVID. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I was. I was a privileged person in the sense that I wasn't on the front lines during COVID in hospitals or in restaurants or in places where people were risking their lives to take care of us. Hi, Hope. It's good to see you. And um, I was in lockdown, um, like a lot of us, with my thoughts, my past, my ghosts, my anxiety, um, all the things that come up when you have time to think and reflect and kind of sit inside yourself. And that was both a good thing and a horrifying thing because it was it was it was restless making it was um, anxiety producing, um, and at the same time it felt like the world was at our fingertips. You know, as this internal reckoning was going on, this internal trying to come to terms with a lot of ways that I had behaved or things I had done or things that had happened. Um, there was the world, um, particularly America, that was in the middle of many reckonings. Right? Um, reckoning with the fact that we had no infrastructure to support a pandemic, although we have all the resources in the world, that our priorities weren't on health care and taking care of people, that black and brown people were dying at twice the rates of other people. In, um, then we had George Floyd and those diabolical public minutes with a knee on his neck. And that was a real reckoning in terms of the history of this country finally bubbling up in a way where it was undeniable. And then there was climate change reckoning, where the fires were going and the, uh, and the birds were literally falling out of the sky because birds, it turns out, have very efficient abilities to breathe and it was their efficiency that was killing them because they can inhale and hold things for a very long time. And so they were inhaling the smoke and dying in droves. So there were all these things that were happening externally and internally and it just got me thinking maybe this is a moment to look through my work and think about what I've been reckoning with um, for the last 45 years of writing. What, what have I been trying, what are the themes, what are the things I've been trying to understand and, and wrestle down? And I've always written in so many different forms because I'm essentially a playwright, but then I've written books and then I've written articles and then I've written, and um, I have a dear friend whose photographs are in this book, a wonderful photographer who has traveled to a lot of war-torn countries with me and she and I just kind of started to go through everything and look at everything and she's got a very fine eye and she's very critical so she'd be like, no, 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 <laughs> oh, this, this could go. And so we began to look to see if there was a way to arrange this or organize around various reckonings. Um, and I think what excites me about this book is that it feels true to who I've been as a writer and and kind of the journey I've had as a writer, which has not been like a straight, linear, I'm a playwright or I'm a journalist or I, what moves me gets expressed in that in, in a certain form, right? So if, if it's a play, for example, about vaginas, that it, only way it could express itself was in monologues. But if it's an article that I'm writing about, um, you know, abortion, then it it comes out as a piece for the Guardian. And, and, and I think I began to find a way to patternize it, to say this could move to this and this could move to that, which really was a joyful experience of, of, of weaving and arranging. It's really, um, I mean, it's really, it's like a, I don't know, I need a better, I need a metaphor. I'm not a quick thinker as a writer, but it's really a, a woven, deliberate craft. I mean, it's, it's organized thematically and it's just beautifully done. Um, I have, I want to read a quote to you from the book. There's a lot of quotes I really love, so I had to narrow it down. But you write, I have always thought about the world simultaneously through my body and my brain. Could you speak a little bit to that, what you meant by that? Well, I think, I think for many of us, um, 
who have had experiences from our childhood where we were kind of forced to leave our bodies, whether it was some kind of abuse or some kind of um, oppression or some kind of um, harm. Um, so much of my life, I've been trying to find a way to get back into my body, to actually live in my body. And um, writing right, was a way that I found that I could kind of write myself back into my body. And I've always believed like our bodies know so much about the world and about people and about things. They're, they've just got an, an inherent understanding and intuition and um, that we don't often value because the brain has gotten a lot of play, you know. And I think sometimes the, the brain does this in. Um, you know, I think often in, until things are metabolized in our body, we can have the greatest theories and understanding of things, but it doesn't lead to action until our bodies feel it and know it and move towards something. And I think that's what I was talking about in the book, like how do you activate knowledge? How do you activate your intellect? How do you move it towards um, transformation and change? Because in the end, that's really what matters. Like we can have all these theories and we can sit around talking, but we want the world to somehow become a better place and, and, and move towards something that isn't what it is in the present tense. It's so funny because I, I'm going off script a little bit here. <laughs> um, one, so I teach at, at American University and I teach most, mostly graduate students in both nonfiction and journalism. And one of the things I tell them to look out for, and they look at me like I'm crazy, really, is when they're doing an interview or when they're in the midst of a piece of writing, whether it's memoir or a poem or whatever, they'll feel it like in their gut. Mm -hmm when they're right. They'll feel a quote that somebody gives them that is so true, it's like capital T truth. And that's that like that's what I'm hearing. Like our bodies know before our brains know. Right? And I think we're I think we're taught often because so much of, of what we're taught is that not to trust our bodies and not to trust our hearts and not you know, I remember the first really big trip I ever took was during the Bosnian War when I had heard about rape camps in the former Yugoslavia. And I had heard of this amazing center for war victims, which was a center run by Croatian, Serbian, and Muslim women. They had decided they were not enemies and that they were not going to act the way that the state was acting and they were gonna take all women who had been raped during the war. And I really wanted to go, and I wrote them, I faxed them over and over and over again, and fin I finally, when they accepted me, I felt like I'd won the Nobel Peace Prize, and, and they, you know, they allowed me to sleep on their couch in the center, and I, I thought I was gonna go for a few weeks, and I stayed for months. And you know, at the beginning, I thought, you know, I'm gonna be distant, and I'm gonna be objective, and I'm gonna sit here like, oh, I don't even know what I was sitting there like, but I thought this is what the way you had to do this, and, and what I was hearing was story after story of incredible atrocity and incredible suffering and incredible pain. And um, I wasn't in it. I was somehow outside it. And I finally had a weekend where this woman gave me her house to sleep in a bed and I just spent the whole weekend weeping. I just was sobbing. I just let myself feel everything I had written and I, I had heard. And I realized after that that um, my job was to sit and be present with people, to be present with them, not to save them, not to rescue them, not to analyze them, not to, to be present. And if that meant that I cried with them, I cried with them. And if that meant we ate you know, chocolates and drank really, but really intense coffee, that's what we did. Um, and everything changed after that. You know, it was the sense of um, being in the story with people, not outside the story with people, which for me is the only way I can write plays is the sense that people are inside me and I'm allowing them to inhabit me so fully that their character begins to express itself. And I think, you know, journalists, I think we're often told to be objective, which is, in my opinion, completely impossible. Um, I, I don't even know what that would mean. Like you would step out of your brain and you would step out of your history and you would step out of your perspective. Um, what you choose to emphasize, what you choose to hear, what seems important to you in the story is based on your story. Um, so I, I think that's kind of misnomer, that idea of objectivity. Um, and I think what I'm really interested in is where does your heart get touched? Where do you feel connected to people? Where do you, where do you hear what you were saying? Like where is their, where is their moment in the story? What is, what, is, what, is the, what is the thing in that story that is gonna be catalytic or transformative or is the core of their trauma or, or, or is the pathway to another 
possible world in their in their own psyche. I know. I feel like as a, as a journalist, I feel like the idea of objectivity is somehow confused with being dehumanized. Mm. Like don't like you're not going to feel the story of the person who is right in front of you. I mean, how how could you not feel that story, mm -hmm. right? Mm. This actually is like a great transition because there's a brief little I wanted to give you all like just a little sense of the book and there's I, w I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading just a, a little paragraph, one of the stories that you um, that you write. It's you're writing a monologue. It's a a woman named Nikki, and I was really stuck uh, struck by this um, paragraph. Is that okay? Yeah. Do you mind? Yeah, and and just to give you context, um, for ten years maybe I worked in a, a shelter for homeless women in New York, the Oliveri Shelter. Um, for women who were unhoused, we called it homeless then, we call it unhoused now, um, and um, they came and they went, and um, I would listen to their stories all day long. Um, um, I would listen to their stories all day long, and um, I wrote a play called Ladies around that period that got done um, at a wonderful um, church and theater called St. Clement's produced by the Music Theater Group, and we did it um, to raise money for the homeless and to lift up their stories so people would under know them. And this is one of the monologues of a woman um, f from that play. I'm going to try to do it in her accent, too. It's what happens when you uh, live outdoors for too long. It all runs together like raw, scrambled eggs. Each part of you bleeds into the other. Your emotions are like your things shoved into one goddamn cheap Woolworths bag. You don't even know what's in the bag after a while and you stop caring. All you know it's heavy and you got to take it everywhere you go because there's no place that wants it, no place to keep it there. And one night you just say, fuck it, fuck the bag, and you leave it. And when you go out, you come back, after two days it's gone. You act like you're really pissed off. You know, who did it? Who took my fucking bag? It's got everything. But deep down... You're relieved because it's gone. And after that, you're gone too, in a way. And it feels better, kind of. I mean, putting her voice in it, it's like incredible. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I just don't think, I've met a lot of people who are unhoused myself, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like something about the way she is able to describe mm -hmm. her her situation is just so powerful. There's a, there's a section in the book where you talk about the first time that the Vagina Monologues was performed in Oklahoma City, right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I saw it in Phnom Penh with this woman over here. <laughs> I lived there six years, she lived there 17 years. Wow. And uh, yeah, you, you don't, you don't, you've never heard the word vagina until you've heard it in Cambodia. <laughs> um, but you talked in this section about Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City after the Vagina Monologues, how so many women came up to you and sort of almost sidled up to you and talked about their rape, their abuse. And this is kind of a two-parter question, but I'll ask the first part first. My question is, why are we so silent about it still today? It's a ten million dollar question. Um, you know, I think part of I, th I think part of living in a patriarchal paradigm is the insistence on women never telling what's going on, partially because they're not believed. I was looking at that woman who was murdered today. You know, she had gone to the police. She had a, a busted eye. She was standing there saying, "My husband just busted my eye," and they said, and the husband manipulated the police and made it believe it was her fault. She's dead now, right? You know, I'll, I'll tell you a really interesting story about Oklahoma City. You know, I when I first started doing the play, and you know, I did it this very little theater in New York, and it like all it, it it became fastly many many women started to come, and then all these brave women would say, "Well, I'm going to bring you to my community," and it was very arbitrary and very random. I'd be in Jerusalem, and then I'd be in Oklahoma City, and then I'd be in Santa Barbara. It was like, and and people's backyards and the little theaters. And there was this woman with huge hair who had come to see it, and, and she was like, "I'm bringing you to Oklahoma City," and I was like, "Are you sure? I don't know if this is really going to go well in Oklahoma." She said, "Nope, we're going to do it." Really? Really, do they even know what vagina? No, I don't know. It was just amazing. <laughs> and so she did it in this kind of warehouse, you know, with a light bulb over my 
my head. And the first night I was really, really scared, like, okay, here we go. And um, the next night they were pulling up with their lawn chairs. I kid you not, it was so packed. But the first night, this amazing thing happened while I was performing. There was, I was, I was doing the Bosnian piece and there was suddenly this rustling in the crowd and there was a screaming out and a young woman passed out when she, I stopped the show, and when she came to, she stood up and she went, oh my God, my uncle raped me. She had literally been in the memory of it and had passed out. And the whole audience gathered around her, and they took care of her, and they supported her, and then I went on with the show. And I cannot tell you how many times that happened where someone would have a heart attack, or someone would have a memory, or someone would, like during the performance of the shows over the years. It was like, it was just like literally going right into people's memory banks and right into to, to the, their bodies where they had suppressed things. And I think part of what happens for women is that we learn how to suppress things because we, A, it's very, very painful to remember. But also when we do remember, there's no place to, to deposit that memory, that's going to support that memory, that's going to help us remember, that's going to believe us, that's going to help us do something about that memory. And I think until women feel safe enough in this culture, in this world, to remember and, and to, to speak it, it's going to remain, remain suppressed. And I think we go through, I think we went through a period of years where that was beginning to happen. And then there became this false memory syndrome movement, I don't know if you remember it, where it was this huge pushback um, where th therapists were threatened with their licenses if they helped people begin to remember. And, and so therapists stopped doing it. And so memories went underground again. And it's, it's very much like the, the waves of patriarchy. We bust through and we begin to have our rights and we begin to move forward. And then the patriarchy, look at abortion rights. It's a perfect example. It, this huge pushback happens where, because we're still living under the, the bell jar of patriarchy. We haven't dismantled it so it can come back at, at any moment, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I just, it's it, amazing to me how many, I mean, 48 languages still, and I, this is, again, I'm going off script, but um, 48 languages, how many, 120 countries, 140 countries. Um, how, like, there's a way in which it feels subversive still today, 25 years later. Mm -hmm. And, I, like, that's so, it, that just makes me despair, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, the Me Too movement was like this tiny little breaking through and then it retracted, right? And and now we have where we're at with abortion rights. And I, in a way, I, it, it, hearing Nikki's story and reading about the Oklahoma City experience with these women kind of, I just, I, I have an image of them almost like sidling up quietly saying me, me Too or this happened to me. And you make, in your book, you make a very distinct line between Oklahoma City 25 years ago and the Brett Kavanaugh hearings today. And I wonder if if you are also, like, are you despairing? Are you seeing hope? Like, where are you? You know, that's that's the $25 million question. You know, I've been involved in the V-Day movement. It, we're, it's literally our 25th anniversary, which is pretty amazing, you know, that we're celebrating. and. This movement's been amazing. We've we've had real impact. We've changed laws. We've been able to say the word vagina across the world. People are telling their stories. We've opened safe houses. We opened the city of joy. We've done amazing things. You know, I was on Christian Amapur show, and she said to me, um, "How is it possible that you and I are still here, 25 years later, having this conversation?" And she was reminding me when she was in the vagina monologues in London, she couldn't say the word, and she asked me to do a monologue where she didn't have to say it. Um, but here we are. And the answer is, we're still in patriarchy. You know, we're still in a system of patriarchy. And in my opinion, until that system is dismantled, until we all agree we don't want to live in a system where there are very, very few people at the top have all the power and they determine what happens to everybody underneath them and we still support hierarchy and we still believe that there are people who matter and there are people who don't, and I can go down the list. Until we are willing to, 
to really fight to say that is not a system I support any longer. It's destroying the planet. It's destroying the earth. It's destroying people. It's destroying the economy. It's what hasn't it destroyed? We're in the we're in the rubble of it, and there's going to be more rubble of it. Mm -hmm. Just look look around the planet. What's happening? I think. Am I despaired? I'm all, I'm always living in a state of constant ambiguity. I think Carl Jung once said, if we're going to survive this century, we have to live with two existing opposite thoughts at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So did Beckett. I can't go on, I will go on. I can't go on, I will go on. That's the state I feel like I'm always living in. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and to some degree, at this point in my life, I, I don't know that I'm going to see the end of violence towards women, trans, and non-binary people in my lifetime. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But I know I'm going to fight to my last day to make that happen mm -hmm. because I don't want to get changed. I don't want to agree to this paradigm. I don't want to agree to a world in which women are being radically abused and denied and cut off and, and hurt and made to feel that they don't have a right to their dreams and their desires and, 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 and their bodies in the, in the form that they are. And, and, and I think all of us have to work and, and, and go deeper and ask ourselves, how much are we willing to do to change this because I think one of the things the patriarchy does is it numbs us. It shuts us down. It gets us to agree. It gets us to accept as opposed to getting radicalized. One billion women on this planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. One billion. Mm -hmm. If all of us made a decision to rise up and change and, 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 and revert and transform, the world would turn overnight. So what's stopping us? What is stopping us? I mean, that's the crucial question. You know, I it, it, there's a there's a story in the in the book, and I really I, I hesitate to even talk about it because it's so painful. I could barely read it. It's about an eight year old girl who has been raped, repeatedly raped, and it, it like my anger is I I almost don't have words for it when I read that section. And you know my my daughter's here today. Love you, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. Um, you know, 14 years old, really very sheltered from these kinds of things. Um, but also, like these kids are all connected in this way that they've never been connected before, right? WhatsApp and TikTok and all these things. And yet, when I read the story of this eight-year-old girl, or when I read what's I, you know, happening in Afghanistan, 500 plus days of girls being and women being prisoners in their homes again. Yeah. Um, I I think of that Edmund Burke quote, right? The I'm going to get it wrong, so I have to look at my notes. But what is uh, you know all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good people do nothing. Mm -hmm. And if like, what would you what would you like to say to us right now about that eight year old girl and about th these moments of despair? What can we do? Well, I think part of, part of it is believing that we can change it. I think it's, I've been just traveling with this book, and everywhere I go, people's despondency is what's really, you know, I was, in, I was in Nashville last night, and people were saying, we can't change these Republicans. We can't change this place from being Republican. We can't change this place from pushing back against women. And I think if that's what you believe, that will be the outcome. You know, if, if that's what you're envisioning, you will be led there. I actually do believe we can change it because I have seen change. I have seen people be transformed. I've seen my own mother, who was actually uh, my father's fourth child and completely controlled by his tyranny and his violence when he died. My mother changed. My mother became somebody else. My mother could hear my story. My mother could apologize. My mother could be in solidarity with me. I never thought that was possible. So if she can change, anyone can change. And I think. Part of it is like, unless we can see the world where we're going, unless we can envision it, we're not going to travel there. And, and part of it is opening our imaginations and beginning to say, what is the world you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where women and trans and non-binary people could walk the streets and wear whatever they want and be safe everywhere in the world? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing where everybody could be who they are in terms of their own gender and sexuality without feeling that they were going to be hurt or bullied or put down or their rights were going to be taken away? Like, what are the things we want? And first of all, imagining that they're possible because without that, it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is, what are you going to do every single day to bring about that 
imaginary place. You know, what, what, what are you going to do it in your art? Are you going to do it on your job? Are you going to do it where you volunteer? Are you going to give in a way that you never thought you could give? Are you going to show up for people that you've never shown up for? Like every single day, what is that essential act that you're going to do to transform consciousness and, and devote your life to it? Because what else are we doing here? You know, I have to believe we're here doing more than performing on TikTok or performing on, 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 on social media or, or just feeding ourselves or isolating ourselves or hunkering down so nobody hurts us. We've got to be more vital than that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Hunkering down so nobody hurts us. That's, that's that it, I can't speak for you all, but that's, that's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. Like, it's just easier to just crawl under my desk. And you have a great... You've coined a, a phrase that I really want to bring into the popular lexicon. So you all go out and speak to your neighbors about it. Disaster patriarchy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that is what a great, what a great phrase to have coined. I wish I'd thought of that first. <laughs> well, it's based on Naomi Klein's book, Disaster Patriarchy, which was a really brilliant book about how um, during disasters, corporations and capitalists move in and take advantage of those of those. Disasters. I didn't know that she coined that phrase. Yeah, disaster. Pay her, I'm going to attribute it, it to disaster you. Disaster capitalism. That was I'm going to start the misinformation yeah. campaign. No, she, right here. she didn't do disaster patriarchy. It was disaster capitalism. Oh, that but book yeah, I know. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And okay. so I started to think about what happened during COVID to women and our rights. And how incredible the pushback was. We'll just begin with battery and domestic violence because you've written the most brilliant book about it. And how women were locked in all over the world with their husbands and their batterers. Nobody thought about it. No, nobody was providing shelters. No one was providing an exit plan. So the rate of violence escalated unbelievably everywhere in the world. Okay, let's look at education for girls, right? Girls, because schools shut down everywhere, girls' education rights were completely undermined across the world. Workers' rights, women and workers' rights. Okay, let's even begin. Women on front lines, women in restaurants, farmers, women working in factories, women working in hospitals. All those rights were pushed back. No one was protecting those women during COVID. You know, it just goes down the line. And I think, I don't think this is accidental. I think all of those things that started to happen to our rights during COVID, very few of them have come back yet. You know, we're still struggling to, to bring back women to where we were. And, and a lot of women, by the way, left the job market because they had to take care of their kids and they had to educate their kids in home, right? So all those women who were beginning to move ahead economically got pushed back into another reality. And I think, you know, these things happen and they are designed because Patriarchy is systemic. It's structural, just like racism. It's built into, it's built into the to the to, to everything and all the DNA of of where we live. You know, I was li listening to my dear friend Kim Crenshaw the other night talking about this horrible thing that's happening in Florida um, with DeSantis and this pushback against teaching African American AP, and. Um, you know, and, and, and the people that they're not teaching are like bell hooks, one of our greatest thinkers in the yeah. world, yeah. Um, you know, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, people who were actually bringing our consciousness to a new place. And she was saying that this is like new, this is segregated knowledge. We're, we're, we're actually going to start segregating knowledge. But I also heard Tennessee Coates saying today, because he's one of the people, that the idea that, oh wait, I, I just blocked out this thought. The idea that we think that we can stop people, oh, I know what it is, that children, we, we're, we're afraid that our children will get overwhelmed by knowing the truth or that they'll feel responsible. What have we become in America? Are we, are we so, is there anything you learn about history that doesn't upset you? There's nothing in history that is good. There's nothing. There's nothing that you read about. No wars. Polio vaccine. Okay. But I'm just saying the majority of things that you learn about history are upsetting, right? Are we now going to have an educational system where we don't upset anyone by the truth and that we're going to protect our children so they live in a bubble? And I think part of what we have to really be fighting for now is why I believe reckoning is so critical is that we live in a country that has never, ever been big on reckoning. It begins with what this country is built on. It was stolen, 
it was based on genocide, it was based on the destruction of the peoples who lived here, who knew how to steward this land, who knew how to love the earth. Then we moved into 400 years of slavery towards African Americans and Jim Crow and mass incarceration that has never been reckoned with. And when the reckoning finally begins, when we're finally beginning to touch it and know it, this fringe minority rises up, these white supremacists, and make a decision that we can't know the truth, because if we know the truth, we actually might get freed from our past and change our present and our future where they will not be in charge and determining existence. And all of us have to be wise enough and clever enough right now, and also fortified enough by each other that we don't allow this to happen. Because any time we move forward, we know there will be contraction. Any time we know when people begin to wake up, there are going to be people who want to put us back to sleep. And this movement of DeSantis is going to be something very powerful in a very quick minute if we all accept it. If we all say it's OK that we don't know our past and that our children are so weak, our children see everything. Our children watch bloody movies where people's heads are being decapitated every hour. They can certainly bear to learn the history of America. And I think, I, I think also the last thing I want to say about this is that everything that happens in terms of racism and white supremacy is, is, has a lot to do with structure. It's built in. It's not about individuals as much as it is, it's built into our institutions, it's built in. So part of it is, don't we want to be individuals who change our structures? Mm -hmm. Don't we want to be awake to the ongoing institutionalized race in, racism, institutionalized misogyny that is present so that we can be part of that change? And I, I just urge us all right now not to allow what's going on in Florida to resist it, to fight back, because it's going to spread. It will start spreading across this country. And soon we won't be teaching anything of, of significance. We'll be back in the dark ages. Mm -hmm. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, I this idea that our children need to be protected from the ugliness is it, what's so infuriating to me is that our children are already growing up in a war zone in America. I have, okay, I see one, two, three, four. You have four girls back there. I know all four of you. I love all four of you. And one of you is my biological child. You four, you go to three different schools. How many of you four have regular um, mass shooting uh, preparations? Uh, yeah, preparations in your schools? Raise your hand. Yeah. yeah, that is not normal. Yeah. These are children growing up in a war zone, right? And if they don't know where the war started, how are they going to ever know how to end them? Yeah, and, and, and I think the irony is we're saying that our, our young people can't know our history when they're living in, in schools where they are checking their, are metal checked as they're walking yeah. through the door. I yeah. mean, th there's an absurdity to that. You right. Know? right. So you know it's not about that. In right. the same way, it's not pro life. You know, like there, there are like the, the right wing. This fringe minority figures out all kinds of ways of telling a story that are not true, but they seem true. And part of what we have to do is resist that, mm -hmm. you know, in every way we can. Um, I have, so we're going to open it up to other questions. Before we do, I, um, I would like to end on your words <laughs> um, from the book. It's a very short passage that I think is one of the most beautiful pieces of writing in the whole book. And I think it's incredibly powerful. And um, you know, I, I would like to invite you all to, if you feel comfortable, to close your eyes and really listen to the images and the way, the way e, uh, V manage, <laughs> manages to move, to, to move the language. And um, let me see where I have it in here. Um, and then we'll and then we'll open up to questions and you should come well let one thing at a time. Yeah. Okay. Ready everybody? Okay. Perhaps the story we are afraid to tell is that we humans are made as much of grief as we are of stars. Our bodies more river than bone grown inside that sacred sack of nutrients and sorrow. What is the heart but a core deposit of crude emotion passed from one generation to the next? For much of my life, I have traveled this river taken by unyielding currents, bloodied by inexorable rocks. 
It called me early on, not because I was brave, but because I was bleeding. I hungered to know the wound, or rather, I hungered to swim through that portal to the other side. I love that. I just love it. And uh, I just want to say one thing about that, mm -hmm. that this goes back to this idea of, of living in a country that can't reckon, that refuses to reckon. We've been taught for so long that the pain will kill us. Go to the pain, the pain will kill us. But in fact, it's the denial of the pain. It's the oppression of the pain. It's the pushing away of the pain. And we do it through all kinds of forms, whether it's addiction or drugs or eating or loneliness or cutting off. I can only share my own experience. When we go to the wound, when we touch the wound, and we go through the wound, there is freedom. And that is in a personal level, and that is in a collective level in terms of our own history. And right now, the wound is pulsing and begging us to reckon with it. It is begging us to reckon with it. And those that want to push us back are pushing us to our end, are pushing us to our death. This country will die in not dealing with its history. It will die. So all of us have to be brave, and all of us have to be willing to touch that pain, to feel our own personal, collective, structural responsibility, and to know that there is lots we can do, and lots we can do to change it, but also just to sit with it, to sit with the grief of it, to sit with the knowledge of it, to sit with the feeling of it, and know we're not gonna die from it, but we're actually gonna be born into a new consciousness and a new future if we allow it. And I can only say we do that collectively. We don't do it alone because it's too hard alone. So find the groups that you can be with who are going through that process so that you can push, even if you have three of your friends where you're reading about things that are hard to deal with and, and, and that you allow yourself to push through and touch into that pain because it's touching into that pain where you get through the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have questions, uh, we are recording this. We're live on YouTube. Um, if you could come up to the mic, that would be great. It would also be mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. You can have feelings, facts, questions. Thank you so much for coming here and for a fabulous talk. And it sounds like a fabulous book. I recently saw two movies that address these issues. She said, I think that's mm -hmm. the name of it, about the journalist that uncovered uh, yeah. the story of Harvey Weinstein and all of that horrible stuff, and uh, Women Talking, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. addresses this issue in a fundamental Christian community. Yeah. And I'm, I was struck by how, f and you touched on it, how fear holds back so many people. And, and in another context, somebody uh, asked me the question, if you didn't have any fear, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm, I want to know, because you seem fearless in a way, uh, but, but how can an individual um, address or be that, like if I could just get rid of my fear, mm -hmm. I, I could do something. Mm. That's a very good question. I, I always think of, of what Martin Luther King said the night he got killed. Um, he, he, he talked about the fact that he has always been afraid. Yeah. And he was afraid that night. But he said, when I let my fear control me, then I'll be finished. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that we get rid of our fear. Yeah. You know, I don't think our fear ever goes away. Um, I think it's a question of, of who you want to be you know, who you want to be controlled by, what you want to be controlled by. You know, um, I see my fear. It's always there. It's like a, it's a friend. <laughs> it's not a friend, but it is a friend in a way. I, I know I can see my fear. And I, I know for me that at this point in my life, one of the great things about aging people, don't let them tell you it's not a good thing because it's absolutely fabulous. I, I would never go back. And I have to tell you, the older you get, the more you just don't give a shit. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you are just willing to say what you feel and be who you are. And if it doesn't work for people, sorry, you know. Um, but it, it's beautiful. And what I would say, what I would say is this: like, 
You need people around you to support you because none of us can do this alone. I have amazing friends and I have amazing people who support me in the world, right? They believe in me. They're by my side. I know they're there if I get attacked in the world. And believe me, do you think speaking about vaginas was easy? There, there were people who just wanted me to die and go away and be buried under the earth. And I had an amazing producer who the more pushback he got, the more he put signs up, you know, huge posters on highways and blew it up. It was just like, no, we're just going to go the opposite direction. So it gave me courage to be bolder. And you need people at your side. We cannot do this alone. But the other thing you have to ask yourself is what are you living for? What are you living for? What's your reason for being here? If your reason for being here is I want to die knowing I did everything in my life to liberate women, trans, and non-binary people so that they could live beautiful, full, free lives. And that I participated every day in my life in ending racism and stopping capitalism. That, that is my life. And, and if I can lie down at my, on my deathbed and say I gave my life to that, I'm good. Like So if you have a purpose, if you have a drive, if you have a mission, then the fear is less because you're always going towards whatever that thing is. And, and you find the people who will be with you on that journey, who will be with you and in, in, in lock arms with you and laugh with you and you know, be driving down roads with, you know, roads with landmines on them and thinking, okay, we could blow up at this moment, but we'll be here, we'll be here together and we're all buzzing on coffee and we'll just keep going. You know? I mean, you'll find a way to keep getting through it. You know? But I think, again, again, we have all been kind of encased in fear. Like there's a way this culture is, like the violence that is surrounding us. There is so much violence in this country. I mean, we have more guns than people, right? How many shootouts have there been already in this year? How many police killings of unarmed black people have happened this year? I mean, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. it's, I just read this afternoon that Tyree Nichols' killer, one of the cops that killed him, sent pictures of it, sent pictures to five people after he did it. Like there is so much violence, right, in our culture right now. And so part of it, that violence is there. The methodology of violence is there to shut us up and shut us down. It has a function to make us afraid. And my feeling is I'm not going to, I'm, I live with a, a father who beat me regularly, who almost murdered me, and I was like, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna stand up to you and you can kill me, but I'm not giving up my voice and I'm not giving up myself and I'm gonna fight. And that's who I've been and I, I, I tell you, I'd rather be gunned down or beat down, standing up for the people I believe in and standing up for what I believe in to shrink away into a hole that they got me to go into. Mm -hmm. And that's what we all have to make a decision about, right, you know? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, I'm uh, in visiting from Wisconsin and uh, for work, and I was talking with the people that I'm here with, uh, two men, one's in his 40s, one's in his 50s. Couldn't go to dinner with them tonight because I said I was coming here, and I bought the book, and I was telling them about the book, and right away one said, oh, I saw the vagina monologues years ago in Chicago, and, you know, they were taken in stride, even though I was a little nervous, saying, you know, from the vagina monologues. And um, anyhow, because we're not like friends or anything, just work people. So, <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah. So that was really neat. But it leads to my question. So I struggle the most. I am struggling with the book. It, it's, it's very hard to read. I mean, it's very powerful. And, um, you know, it, breaking my heart of course like anybody who's reading those stories and obviously you wrote them it's just it's so moving and my biggest struggle is with women that I talk to about you know we were out here during the Kavanaugh hearings mm -hmm. and and I went back home to Wisconsin and you know I heard about well the, none of that's true and those women are lying and it was the same thing with Harvey and they're lying and all they want is fame and they did that and they're lying and my hardest thing is is I think truly it, not the men in my life that I talk to about issues of abuse of women, but the, the women that I talked to. And I was just curious about, you know, your thoughts on that. It's a really good question. Um, you know, um, remember that everybody is uh, 
encased in racist patriarchy, right? We all grew up in the, in, in the sea of it, right? We're all in it. And my feeling is, I remember when we started V-Day in the early days and, and, and we would say, who do we want to invite to perform at the first event? And somebody would mention somebody who appeared to be right wing. And they were like, no, 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 we can't invite her, we can't invite her. And I would say, no, no, no. There's a seat at the table for every woman. Yeah. There's a seat at the table. They're going to come eventually, and let's just hold their seat. Let's not make a decision, because they've been poisoned by the same poison that we've been poisoned by. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is this, you know, when the Brett Kavanaugh, remember that Brett Kavanaugh hearing shot where all those women were standing behind him laughing and enjoying? Um, I, I wrote this piece, and it's in the book. It was, it's, it, it was Dear White Women in America, you know. And what, what I said in that piece was, I know, I believe, I know where you are. You know, my mother had an allegiance to a perpetrator. She allied herself with a perpetrator against me as her child. Mm -hmm. She saw my father beating me, almost killing me. She knew on some unconscious level my father was incesting and sexually abusing me. She did not protect me, right? She did not protect me because why? My mother did not have a skill. She did not have a job. She had three kids. She had no economic power. She didn't know where she'd go. She was controlled by that situation. Now, I'm not justifying her, but there are many, many women in this world in this, who are in very, very similar situations and also who have been brought up to believe that men are always right. You listen to the man. You bow down to the man. You do what the man tells you no matter what. You have his political opinions. You, have his, you vote for who he tells you to vote for. And if you go against that, you go against the family. You go. I mean, there's so many things built, hardwired into us. So part of it is... Can you work on one woman to begin to help her change? Can you befriend one woman who you sit with and you begin to help her look at her own story? How did she get there? What does she think? Who, are these your thoughts? Are those his thoughts? What do you believe? Because that's what it's going to take is all of us taking the time to help people. You know, I, did, I started this project and I don't know where it's going, but I decided I was going to interview young women in this country or women who had been former Formers, former KKK people, former um, Nazis, former, S I mean, and, and I started to interview them. And I have to tell you, it was really hard. But one of the things I discovered, which was really shocking, was every single one of them felt excluded, felt bullied, felt put down, felt ashamed because they were poor, felt ugly, felt fat. I mean, I can just go down the list. And when these people came, to invite them into their cult. They gave them a place to belong. They, they appreciated them. They loved them. Most of the time, these women didn't even know what the ideology was. They liked the outfits, right? They liked wearing the, the boots and, the, and, and whatever, and they liked belonging. So part of it is we who are, uh, who are here have to make people feel belonged, make people feel that they belong, make people feel included, make people feel seen, make people feel loved, not shamed and, and attacked and put down because that just pushes people further away. And that requires patience, that requires compassion, that requires a fundamental belief that people can change and come over. And you know sometimes they can't and sometimes they'll stay in that place and sometimes they can. My brother, for example, who for years and years and years, we, we, haven't sp we don't really speak because I think sometimes when you grow up in a very violent family, um, you splinter and there's, it's very hard to come back from that. But when I put out the apology, I sent it to my brother because I wanted him to see it before it was published. And he wrote me back and he said to me, my brother lives in Oklahoma, he's very far out in the other world. He wrote me back and he said, thank you. You finally told the truth about our family. I don't know how you did it. And you know what? That was momentous in my life. My, my brother admitting that it happened, my, my brother admitting that we'd been through that because the denial has been so thick. Do you know what I mean? The push down, the denial. It's, it takes time. It takes patience. It takes listening. It takes going in and believing that person is not going to be that person forever and that people can change. You know? and, that, and I think that's the hardest work. And it's the work none of us want to do. We, we just want to be positional and polarized and say, you're bad, I'm good, you're wrong, I'm right. But meanwhile, those people are spreading. And, and the bad news and the entities that are, are getting into them is making them crazier and crazier. You know. Hi. Addison, I love this girl. <laughs> 
Hi. So I like remember you talking about like going to like rape camps in Yugoslavia and like all of these crazy stories about women and how like it affects you. So like my question is kind of more like how do you like go from like learning about all these like horrific stories about women to like going back home? Like how does it like mm. how do you like take care of yourself so you can like take care of others and like not like like mm. completely just like that's such yeah. a great, that's a really, really great question. Um, and to be honest with you, I didn't do a very good job of it for a long time. Um, I think um, I got very, very sick 13 years ago. I got stage slash three, four cancer, uterine cancer, and I almost died. And I think a part of that was I didn't, I wasn't taking care of myself. I was sitting, I, I actually, on my way to the Mayo Clinic, I had an image of this barn, uh, this, this, this ball of yarn, and there were just ribbons of stories of women that I had heard, and they were just wrapped around it, and, and it was my tumor, you know? Um, I take better care now. I think when you sit with stories, and when you read stories, and when you process stories, you have to share it with people. You have to take time to cry, and scream, and dance, and, and, and express it, and get it out of your system, because it lodges in your body. And you have to express it in some way. So writing really helped me, writing about it, talking about it, putting it out into the world. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it. It just means we have to take care of ourselves when we are looking at it. Do you know what I mean? And make sure that check, you check in with your body. I, I was so out of my body, I wasn't listening to what was happening inside it, you know, which is why a tumor grew, a very big tumor grew, you know. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think we'll take these last two and then do some signing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much. I have a question about writing process um, and embodiment, I guess. And I'm writing about things that have happened to me. And you know, you have, you know, what has happened to you, and you know what has happened to the women around you. Um, but what do you do when you hear the other voice that's telling you that you're making it all up still? or that it wasn't that bad, could have been worse. Um, kind of how do you, you know, you feel that in your body and how do you get back to the place of knowing that this is the truth um, and it's worth writing? Mm. Such That is like the critical question, you know what I mean? Because I think the patriarchy lodges itself in our, us. It, it's like there, it's always there telling us you don't know you're making nothing. We're, we're, we were gaslit constantly, right? I mean, my father would be beating me up, telling me he wasn't beating me up, right? Like, on, honestly, banging my head against the wall, saying nothing bad is happening to you, right? Like, so I'd be like, wait, wait, is this happening? Like, you just become so distorted. And I think you begin to have a dialogue with that voice. You begin to talk to it. You begin to say to it, you know, I, I think you don't really want me to know. You know, my father... Um, I was obsessively scrupulous and honest as a child because my father was so insane about it. And to the point where I would actually admit to doing things I hadn't done. Do you know what I mean? I was like, if somebody in class, somebody was, stole something, I was like, I did it. I was like, I didn't even do it, but I was so f terrified, right? But what my father did, geniusly, is he convinced my entire family I was a liar, right? He convinced them. He, he had ways, but I realize now, of course he did. Because as he was dying, as he was on his deathbed, he said to my mother, no matter what Eve tells you when I'm gone, she is lying. Mm -hmm. She is lying. Mm -hmm. And my mother said to me, had he not said that, she never would have believed me. Mm -hmm. But even in his last moments, he was trying to create me as a liar, mm -hmm. right? Because that would delegitimize my understanding, my vision, my knowledge, what I knew, right? And I think that's what patriarchy is constantly doing to women. We're not smart enough, we're too emotional, we're hysterical, we wanna go down the list. You know, I mean, there are words, words, words. So part of it is just going, first of all, who are you? Why are you saying this to me? And then beginning to just go, I'll talk to you later. Let me just finish this and we'll come back to you. Because what I've learned is get it all down on the page, and then later on, you can decide how much you want to put into the world. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Just tell your, write your story, say your story, let out what's going on inside you, and then you can edit it if you want to later on to go into the world. You know, my mother said a really, really, really amazing thing to me once um, after I confronted her and told her what my father had done to me, and we had it out. And she called me, she called me out of the blue one day, and she said, 
I'm, I'm just so upset. I'm crying. I'm crying. I said, what's going on? And she said, what if I meet your father in the next world and he's really mad that I believed you? And I went, wow. Patriarchy is deep. Yeah. I said, send him to me. I'll be happy to talk to him, you know? But, but just the idea that he was hovering for her mm -hmm. in the new, next realm, yeah. that he was going to meet her there, that's how powerful this stuff is. Mm -hmm. That's how drilled into us that violence is. Mm -hmm. That's how scared we've been made. So part of like every time you can throw off one of those shackles, you can just go, shoo, shoo, you get free and you get a little braver and you get, shoo, there's another shackle. And then you're like, shoo, then you're like, okay, there's a big shackle. You know, you just have to keep throwing them off, right? Because they've got us in their clutches and that clutch takes the form of sickness. It takes the form of drug addiction. It takes the form of hurting your body. It takes the form of not being able to be intimate. There's so many ways that, that, that they've got our, th got our throats. So the more brave you are, the more you get voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Know. Thank you. Um, All Simone's these young women. in the house, Yay. I know. Yeah. That's my um, daughter's so, best friend right here. <laughs> so earlier in the talk, you were talking about how um, people growing up now feel like they have to repress their opinions in fear of being criticized and stuff. And I feel like that I experienced that in like high school right now. Like I feel like I can't express my own opinions about gender and sexuality and all the things happening in this world because of fear that I will be judged, I will be criticized, people will like make fun of me and I have to not tell people what I truly believe about this in fear of like fitting in once again with like, oh yeah, I don't want like the men to be like yelling at me or whatever. How do I, I want to find a way to like express my voice and I need to find a way like to do it without people like, I understand that people will criticize me for like expressing my true opinions, but how do I find a way that's like still like safe and that I won't feel like that? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I'm not sure I can lead you to the path of no safety, okay? Because the truth of the matter is when you speak out, there's going to be people who don't like you. There's going to be people, I, I read something, I don't know, I was re reading something lately, um, only an idiot would change your name, like speaking of me, and I was just like, wow. That's nice. Okay, moving on. Like, there was a time... Have they been introduced to 1920s Hollywood? <laughs> I know. But it, it, was, it was just like a mean... And I knew that person was anti-feminist. I knew that... Per, I, but they all disguise it. There's a way that people... Mm -hmm. You know, people never come at you and call you a feminist or call you, you know, an anti-racist or call you... They c come at you and they call you stupid or they, you know, or ugly mm -hmm. or fat. Or they just come at mm -hmm. ways where they think your, your Achilles heel is. And... I, I can only say this for me. I have been through the ringer of people attacking me in my life. And I have had a hard time with it. I have some days have to go to bed and just cry for a day. But now I'm in a new place because I'm going to be 70 and I just feel like, fuck it. Just fuck it. Like, we all have to get to a point where we get, you have your opinion, you have your opinion, and I have mine. And who are you fighting for? Who are you fighting for? Who are you fighting with? Who are you in solidarity with that makes you brave? Because if we just fight for ourselves, it's hard to be brave. But when I'm fighting for my sisters in Congo, I feel brave. When I'm fighting for my sisters in Afghanistan, I feel brave. When I'm fighting for women who have been shot by black women who have been shot by the police and, and, and I'm out of vigil to say her name, I feel brave. When I'm not, when it's not about me, when I get beyond me, I can stand up for things. And I think we live in a culture of me, 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 I, 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 I. I mean, I, I, I blame Reagan for that uh, more than anyone because I think he ushered in the time of the neoliberal, individualistic, take care of yourself and forget about everybody else. We have to get back to a time when we're connected to each other. When our, we know that our welfare is completely interdependent with each other and with the earth. There is no separation that's completely illusion. So find your, find your gang. Find your gang of women at school who you can be brave with. You know, in my, in my high school and college days particularly, I had a group of feminist sisters, and we, and, and, and we just we just tore up the place. Mm -hmm. And we had opinions, and we put out magazines, and we put it, and there were people who hated us and came after us. But it didn't matter because we had each other and we had our own beliefs. You've just got to have a group of people that has your back so you can be brave. But don't cut your voice off. Don't step back. Step forward into this world, you know? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being a wonderful, wonderful...
And I you mean, will sit here and sign some books, yes, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. 